Today's video is gonna be a little different. Today we're gonna to talk about the day that Bud Jackson fell in the Owl House. Now what do I mean by that? Like, if you're familiar with an Owl House, it's a place where you go do your business, right? And it's like a little shack and you open up the door and then there's a seat. And Bud Jackson was in our Owl House and the seat broke and he fell in all of the duty. It was quite an event because um, he was screaming and hollering and then so the men had came and got him and they had to get some rope, put down the rope to get him out and pulled him up. And then next door, Mr. Kenny Brew sprayed him off with a hose because he was covered in poop. And it got me to thinking, I grew up in a house with no running water. And until I got to Bodenfield High School and was introduced to the upper class blacks of Holiday Hills, I was completely and oblivious to the fact that I was poor. Had no clue. Didn't have any understanding. It took um, that matriculation from Adamsville Elementary to Bodenfield for me to start understanding the differences between class and economic wealth and reality. And, you know, I was just thinking about that day that Bud Jackson fell in there because at that point, when the seat broke, we no longer had an outhouse. We, we no longer had a usable outhouse. So it got kind of dicey and this started the process of us getting indoor plumbing. We had a kitchen that had indoor running water, but we did not have an indoor bathroom, which to the poorest person sounds crazy. But <clears throat> one of the things is, I remember one night I had to use the bathroom really, really bad. And this is when Alabama, Alabama used to have four distinct seasons winter, fall, spring, and summer. And in the winter, I can remember um, ice on the ground. Like, if it rained, it would turn to ice. I can remember snowing. I can remember cold winter days where I would be in the house and be looking out and it looked bleak and it looked cloudy and it was cold. I mean, it was cold, cold. I remember walking to school with my jacket on and yeah, I don't even know if there are four distinct seasons in Alabama at the moment. And there was a lot of talk that it was uh, all of those rockets they were sending up to space that was messing up the winter weather pattern. But I remember growing up in a shotgun house. Now, what is a shotgun house? We didn't have any hallways in that house. You just went from room to room. You came into the fr uh, from the front porch into the living room into what was, we used as the dining room, which later became uh, my bedroom. And then you went to the kitchen and then there was an area that they turned into the bathroom and there was another room and there was my mother's room. I grew up in the house and didn't have no hallways. We did have a few closets. And I, I tell you this to illustrate how far I have come in life because um, that outhouse day, I mean, we had to get a bucket to do our business in. And this is something that people do who like to do uh, van life and go camping. They do this kind of stuff all the time. But you know, for a little kid, it was kind of like, uh. Today's video was brought to you by Glendon Cameron School with the foundational course of home economics. Now, I'm going to keep preaching this because everyone's like, start a business, make more money. Here's the problem with that. If you don't learn how to manage money properly before you get it, you're going to trick off on it. You'll be up in the strip club throwing dollars and doing stupid stuff. So go to Glendon Cameron School and enroll in home economics. And if you want to really enhance your game, we're getting ready to start the business training for the rebirth of Hustlers Kung Fu which will get you into foundational, fundamental education. 
That's gonna start a little later this month, but right now you have time to go through home economics, which is about 95% done. So go, links below, go ahead and check it out. You know, I was just sitting there, I was just thinking, because you know, um, me and my girl, we went out to dinner to a place off of Howell Mill. And Howell Mill has gone through multi-billion dollar projects. Their Howell Mill at the intersection of Northside Drive. That used to be the hood. And we were at this place called OK. It was a, a sushi place and it's close to the Barcelona wine bar. And we were just sitting there and we're on the roof and we're eating and stuff and we were looking out. And my girlfriend's like, your view is much better than this view and these people are paying just as much as you are or more. And this, this is one of the things that I learned. And one of the things I'm probably gonna do in the future is go back to Alabama and just film my neighborhood and take the drone up to really show you what I started with, where I came from, because I get a lot of people who want to dicker and disagree. And if you really knew, I didn't come out the mud. We were too poor to afford mud. Um, where I came from and the matriculation that I got from where I came from to the matriculation to the age of 42. At 42, I became a millionaire. You, it would literally blow your mind because once again, I did not understand that I was poor growing up in the 70s. I had no concept. I was just, <clears throat> and one of the reasons is there was no social media, none. And all of my friends were pretty much in the same boat. We, I had some friends that lived in nicer houses, but this is one of the things. Um, when I was a boy, Unless you really, really knew these people well, you didn't go in the house. As far as you got would be the front porch. And a lot of my friends, I have no clue to what their bedrooms look like. Because I never went in their house. I would like go knock on the door and I was like, hey, can Marcus come out to play? And next thing, no, Marcus would emerge. Uh, there was none of this going in someone's room and just hanging out. No, 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 no. You would go, I would go get Marcus, we'd get on the bikes, we'd go to the park, we would play outside. I do not remember, and oh, once we got to talking to girls, you never went to her room. You were on the front porch or the living room. That was it. There was none of this going in her room and closing the door stuff. No, 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 that, that didn't happen. And I was listening, because this, this week I've been listening to a lot of music from the 60s and the 70s, the original Jackson 5, because when Michael was with his brothers in the Jackson, that's, I grew up with that. And I feel that my childhood until about age 11 was pretty perfect, even though we were poor. Because once again, understand, I had no awareness that I was poor. It was just the way it was. So there was no envy or thirst. Like I said, I had some friends who lived in nicer houses, but once I wasn't up in their house. I mean, I remember some people, I would, you know, if you really, really got to know them, you can go in the house and you go to the living room, you go to the kitchen and stuff. I don't ever remember going to anyone's bedroom. I don't ever remember that as a kid because there was boundaries. There were places that you could go. And this is the thing, no one actually had to explain this to me. I would never ask an adult person, how come I can't go to her bedroom? No one had to explain it to me. It just wasn't proper protocol. And one of the things, like I said, until age 11, because um, here's my situation. Even though I was poor, and I grew up in a house with no running water, I had somewhat of a middle class upbringing. And let me explain. My grandmother was my stay at home mother. So for foundational educational development, I had a stay at home parent. 
And a lot of my friends had similar situations because they had a grandmother or an uncle or an aunt that lived with them, because this is something else too. And this is one of the reasons that, you know, there were people who were having sex when I was a kid, but it wasn't rampant because there wasn't the opportunities to have sex. Just, you just didn't have places. You couldn't, like I said, you just couldn't go in their house. And going back to me having a middle-class upbringing, my grandmother had a college degree and my grandmother taught me to read before I went to school. Now this is really interesting because my grandfather did me an incredible blessing because I'm dyslexic and when I was a child, I had a speech impediment. I had to go to speech therapy from the first grade to the sixth grade. I would leave class and go to these traders and we'd flip over these flashcards so I can learn how to pronounce words. So I was dyslexic and I had a speech impediment and because my grandmother taught me to read and you know, it was my grandmother. She cared for me, she loved me. So she figured out a way to teach me how to read because I had these developmental issues and because my grandmother was a college educated woman and my grandmother was a teacher, I got the benefit of an upper middle class bringing, because this, this is one of the things. Uh, my grandmother and my mother were voracious readers. So I grew up reading a lot of books. I grew up reading the newspaper. I grew up having conversations over dinner about the stuff that we read in the newspaper. This doesn't really happen except in certain families. There are certain families that still behave and operate this way, but it's not the norm. And that is one of the reasons, because you know, I'm about to go ahead and share this with you. My first girlfriend in life, my first kiss, didn't have sex, didn't have sex with her, but my first kiss was with Rebecca, a white girl, a red-headed, green-eyed white girl. That was my first girlfriend. And once again, I grew up in a black neighborhood. And one of the reasons that I noticed that even though I was black, I had a lot in common with my upper class white peers and to a degree my black, because you know, uh, the people in Holiday Hills, they were a different kind of breed. It was a different kind of breed, different attitude, because they had money. And once again, when I left Adamsville Elementary and went to Bodenfield, which was a middle school, because you, you went to an elementary school, then you went to a middle school, and then you went to high school. I think some places, they just go from elementary to high school, and high school starts in seventh grade. But that's how our school system was set up. And I remember Tanya Green. And when I was, you know, in the last video, the names came to me. Jenna and Jana Rollins. These were the girls, uh, the girl had a Celica who would drop me off at uh, Forestdale when I went to Holy Family High School. Jenna and Jana Rollins. And um, beautiful girls. And this is the thing, they were, they were like cover girl beautiful. Like, I would not be surprised if later in life they were models or something like that because they were just that naturally beautiful, classic cheekbones and beautiful and beautiful skin. And the thing with them was they were very, very nice girls. Very nice, very sweet, very kind girls that happened to be extraordinarily beautiful. So it was a perfect combination. But I actually, resonated and communicated and was able to relate to those people even though I was poor because of my grandmother. Um, once I became an educator myself, because I'm an educator, I have bschoolforhustlers.com, I have the Glendon Cameron School, I learned the importance of education. The importance of education, and I'm about to say something that a lot of people are gonna throw stuff at the computer screen, if you get a girl pregnant and you want that child to have the best optimum outcome, 
you will marry that woman and you will create a family. That is the perfect situation. Unless you got a situation where you got a grandma who's gonna be standing home with the kid because it's, it worked, because I can attribute my success today to my foundational education from my grandmother. That's just how important this stuff is because it gives you confidence. As a kid, I never felt unsafe. Um, lived in the same house until I joined, left to join the military. I never felt unsafe. I never, and once again, for a kid, stability is everything. Because you have kids who were literally, they moved every year. Now a lot of these people have anxiety issues and trust issues because they were never in the position where they can blossom in one spot. Because one of the things that happened to me is I have this viewpoint that regardless of what, everything's gonna be okay. And that came from my foundational upbringing because time and time again, I will tell you a crazy story. I used to be a break dancer. I know that's gonna be funny. Uh, Boogie, the book was like, uh, the break, these, all these break, down, break dancing movies I love. And I used to pop and lock and, and then uh, I used to do the break dancing and I used to be able to do the helicopter. It's this move where you're on the floor and you're spinning around. And then I hit a growth spurt and it threw off my center of balance. But if you notice that the best break dancers are not that tall, there's a reason. Because when you're doing these spins and helicopter moves, if you're too tall, like one summer, um, I had a seven, eight inch growth spurt, you know, because uh, I was like, five foot five foot five when I was break dancing really well and then I became six one messed up everything and I I remember I was in the living room and it was break dancing and we had this mirror sitting on the mantel and it was a fireplace and I was break dancing and like there were several almost catastrophes with me break dancing. I remember because we had the linoleum floor and if you know anything about break dancing, the linoleum floor is perfect and you want to wear the right clothing so you can spin with less friction, right? Uh, one time I was in the dining room, I was break dancing and I hit the china cabinet and that sucker started falling over and fortunately for me, I was extremely athletic and very quick and I was able to pop out this breakdance move and catch the cabinet before it landed on me. But with the mirror, I was breakdancing, I hit a move, I hit the mirror, next thing I know, break the mirror. And back then, there was a superstition that if you broke a mirror, you have seven years of bad luck. I did not have seven years of bad luck. I had seven years of extremely good luck. The next day I went out and I got a job and then I got the job at sign builders and then I got to deal with the Holy Family and you know so from a standpoint and I'm not really superstitious I don't really believe in that stuff and uh, you know this is another thing I was in the living room one day and I was about 15 ish maybe 16 ish and this hot coin drops out the ceiling. I told this story before, but I don't know what that was about. The coin was hot. It was a foreign coin. It dropped out the ceiling. I caught it. I looked at it. Then it just disappeared. I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that came from. But looking at my uh, upbringing, I grew up in the age of eight track, you know, cassette decks. These big old thick, I mean, these big old cartridges, and you put the eight track in your car. And I remember my mother got a stereo from uh, the stereo store on credit. It had a phonograph and it had an eight track. And I remember playing Percy Sledge, Donna Summer, uh, the Ohio Players. And that was my childhood. Listening to them. And one of the things I used to love because the Ohio players, if you remember the Ohio players, their album covers usually had naked women on them. 
And I remember going to the Kmart and sneaking around and like, and then going to look at that album cover. I remember one of the album covers had a, a, a black woman with an afro and she was naked and she had the perfect breasts. That was the album cover. So and Kiss, Kiss, the rock band, uh, there was a picture of them uh, surrounded around this naked woman on her knees with, with uh, Gene Simmons with one breast and another Kiss member holding another breast. That's what was going on. So. In the 70s and the 60s, sexuality was very open. Open except for homosexuality. You know, blatant heterosexuality was quite open and you know, people were fucking, people were fucking. But from a standpoint, I do remember this, that, you know, in every neighborhood, there was a classification of what you would call bad kids. But when I was growing up, the bad kids, if they felt that you came from a good family and you had a chance to have a good life, they wouldn't let you play with them. I remember uh, some of these kids, I, I'm not mentioning their names because I know many of them are still alive, and they were um, smoking weed and drinking beer, and I, I was hanging out and I was like, and they said, man, you don't need to smoke this weed, you don't need to drink this beer, you got a future, man. And they wouldn't let me do it. They wouldn't let me do it. And that's how society has changed because even people who were in derogatory environments, they recognize someone coming from a good environment and they wouldn't try to drag them down. Now, hey, hit this blunt, drink this alcohol. It wasn't like that when I was a kid. It wasn't like that at all. I will tell you that we used to fight. I mean, boys used to fight. I remember getting in a lot of fights a lot of fights as a kid. And I'm talking, and a fight will usually last two, maybe three minutes. It wouldn't be like all day. And I remember I got in a fight and I got beat down by these two kids. And I ran home crying. And I remember talking to my mom about it and she said, you need to get revenge. If you don't get those guys, I'm gonna beat you worse than they beat you. So I was on a mission and I remember all right, so I couldn't beat both of them up at the same time, but I could take one on one. So I plotted and planned. Then one day I was walking down the street and I saw one and he was by himself. So I picked up a rock and I may not look like it, but I was extremely fast. I was extremely fast as a kid. And I started running and he saw me and he started running and I walked him down and I took that rock and went bah! right across his head. And he fell down, his head was bleeding and everything. And then I started kicking him. And I was like, you ever mess with me again, I will fucking kill you. And you know, an old man's like, hey, hey, y'all stop that fighting, y'all stop that fighting, right? And I was kicking him and everything. And he was crying and all this other stuff. So I got him. And it took about four weeks to get the other one. And I caught him alone. And this time my weapon of choice was a big stick. Because, you know, I grew up around, you know, a bunch of trees and stuff. So I picked up the stick. He saw me. He started running, walking down. Shoom! Hit him right across the neck with the stick. And he, he stopped running. And he was like, ah! Then I was just beating him with the stick. Like, you know that uh, a Christmas story where the kid was like beating another kid and he was cussing? That was me, except I was wearing him out with a stick. And, um, you know, and some other older people saw it. It's like, hey, hey, hey. Y'all stop that fight and stop that fight and I'm gonna tell your mother because she knew my mother and they knew his mother and it got to him because I beat him really, really bad. I mean, you know, he was hurt and his mother uh, called my mother and my mother told me, she's like, well, your son and this other kid both jumped on my kid and I'm gonna tell you what I told him. I told him to extract revenge because if he didn't extract revenge, I was gonna beat him worse and he did exactly what I told him. You should tell your kid not to be picking on kids and not to be ganging up on kids. And my mother hung up the phone. And word got out, you know, I will come back, you know. And I didn't ever have um, any issues until Byron Mixon was in uh, eighth grade and it was at my locker. 
And then Byron Mixon, for some reason, unbeknownst to me, he just kicked me because I was facing my locker and he kicked me. And then when I saw it, chased him. And he was kind of like, he, 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 was, he was a little dude, but I was kind of chubby. And I, I started running. He didn't know I was as fast as I was. So I walked him down and I caught him by the band room. And what I did is I just jumped on him and I grabbed his neck and we both went down. And I actually broke his collarbone. Broke his collarbone. And then this is what's wild. He got suspended and I didn't because of Mrs. Hawthorne. Mrs. Hawthorne was like, Miss Hawthorne, she saw the whole thing and she was running down the hall and she's like, he had no choice. I saw Byron, he kicked him, his back was turned. And you know, and we went to Mr. Phillips and Mr. Phillips, he heard the story and uh, Byron got suspended and I didn't. And then they tried to sue us because uh, he had to go to the hospital and medical bills. And once again, you know, I went home and told my mother what happened and she said, okay. Because my mom was all about do not let anyone punk you. Do not let anyone put their hands on you. And you know, this was what's funny. Um, girls interest in me, because at, at one point I was completely invisible to girls, just completely invisible. It's like, and uh, girls started to notice me and they would come up and it's like, yeah, hey, you whoop Byron's ass. You're kind of aggressive. I kind of like that. And I remember a sociology class and I was in there and then Becky passes me a note and it was like, do you like me? Yes or no? And I put, cause Becky, she had a big butt for a white girl, pretty girl, red hair, green eyes. And I was like, yes, and I slid the note back to her. Then she wrote me another note. I like you too. And then we were just passing notes and it's like, you want to be my boyfriend? I was like, hell yeah, hell yeah. So that was my first kiss, first hand holding. And it, it caused somewhat of a stir because interracial couples were really a, a big thing back then. And I remember one time we were walking down the hallways, holding hand, everybody was fucking looking and people were whispering and stuff because you know, the lunch assignment, at that time I was playing football. So I sat at the jock table. But before I started playing football, I sat at the nerd table because I was a big nerd. And then you had the popular kid table, then you had the cheerleaders. It was really, and th this is one of the things that's very interesting. People self-segregated. No one made anyone do this. People chose to do it of their own free will. And I'm over at the football table, then sometimes I would flip-flop between the football table and the nerd table. Cause those were my dudes, right? Cause we had all had similar experiences, people picking on us and everything. And I remember after I broke Byron Mixon's collarbone, the nerves was like, you go, man. I mean, they were hyped. And Jimmy Giovanni, which is real sad. Jimmy was like a practically a genius. He had skipped three grades, so he was, intellectually capable of doing the work, but from a socialization standpoint, he was suffering because he was three years younger than everyone else. And then, you know, we were starting to get into girls and stuff. And Jimmy was like, he ended up killing himself because he, he just freaked out. But yeah, and then um, I'd be straight up. I never got any pussy in high school, never. I got a girlfriend, I got to kiss, I got to feel some titties. I got to feel some pussy, but I never stuck my dick. Actually, this is an interesting story. You know the first Alabama pussy that I got? I was in Fort Sam Houston, Texas. There was a girl named Christy, because we were both in AIT, and Christy was over here, and I was you know, in uh, 91 uh, Bravo, medical laboratory tech um, and she was in the same class and I remember you know I just saw her because you know I went through a transformation in basic training uh, I lost because I was about 220 ish when I graduated high school and I went to basic training and I got down to a tight 185 190 I came home people didn't even recognize me so when I went to Fort Sam Houston that 
physical shape actually got me, opened a lot of doors for me. And I remember with Christy, and we were just messing around, and then one day she just started kissing me. Next thing I know, we're in the cab going to the hotel. And that was the first Alabama, I had to leave Alabama to go to Fort Sam Houston, Texas to get into some Alabama trim. And I remember, you know, we got naked and I saw, you know, like I said, I seen titties, but you know, I've never seen the whole titties and pussy and naked stuff. I'm getting to bed and I put my dick in. I probably came two minutes, two minutes, cause it was, it was great. It was just like, oh fuck, this is pussy? Shit, I have been missing out. And back then, you know, I was able to reload very quickly, like practically, I could bust it. And I, I rolled over and I was like, oh my God, that was fantastic. And she said, yeah, I liked it too. And then we start kissing and I start sucking on the tip of the next thing I know, I was ready again. And this time I fucked her about 30 minutes because I had busted and uh, she actually came. And then that was like, that was crazy. At that point, then Christy apparently uh, wasn't smart enough to stay in the coursework because what you would do, what the army would do to you at that time is if you flunked out of uh, lab school, they would send you down the hill to 91 Bravo, uh, 91 Alpha, medical assistant. And those guys were running around, because we, we wore whites. We were kind of like, it was kind of like going to college. We had um, one person that kind of looked after us, but for the most part, 90% of the time, we were on our own. And it was like in college, and you know, I, because my last name was Cameron, I went to the morning class and went to school at four fucking o'clock in the morning. And um, then there was an evening shift. And then I met, I ran into this, this white girl from Massachusetts and she had this Massachusetts accent. And I remember she was thick. She was really, really thick. She was my fire guard buddy. And I remember one night she was on fire guard. And for some reason, I've always been sexually curious because like I said, uh, growing up, I was a big reader, right? And anything my mother brought in the house, we could read. And my mother was reading a lot of these Sidney Sheldon um, novels, and they were very graphic. So even though I wasn't having sex, I knew about a lot of sexual acts. And I remember um, she got off fire guard duty, and I snuck into her room, and her roommate had gotten uh, recycled. Now, so she had a room by herself. And that was the first time I got my dick sucked. And I nutted in her mouth and she swallowed every bit. I actually spent the night in her room. She sucked my dick again. I fucked her. I was like, Psh. and then uh, she graduated. And then I got uh, my another girlfriend, Sharon, because this this was wild. The whole time I was in high school, I was a nerd, right? So I was invisible to women. But then that transformation at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and going to Fort Sam Houston, that just opened up so many. I became, what's the, what's Ron Wills? I became what, what you would call select because of the body. Women were choosing me left and right. I, I had no problems getting a girlfriend. Uh, the whole time between Fort Sam Houston and Hawaii, I had no issues ever getting a girlfriend. It was be like, hey, I'm Glendon. Hey, how you doing? Let me suck your dick. It, it just went like that. And I remember I was dealing with this black chick in Hawaii. And for some reason I was in her room and she was in the robe. She had just taken the shower. And I don't know how my dick ended up in her mouth. And I was getting ready to bust and I was trying to take my dick out. And she grabbed my ass and she kept it. I was like, Man, the experiences that I had just kind of, you know, going from where I was, and this was in the 80s, like, uh, I got pictures. I may uh, post some of the pictures in the uh, community post, but 
show you the kind of girls I was fucking. I mean, it was like so easy. It was, it was like, you know, we're in Hawaii, we would go to Waikiki. I remember going to the North Shore, seeing the whales. It, it was just so easy to meet a girl and establish a relationship. Uh, I feel sorry for the men of today. I actually do because you guys don't know what it's like to actually see a girl and not even have game. Just like, hi, how are you doing? How you doing? Let's hang out, okay. Next thing you know, you're fucking. It was so easy. It, it, now it has become um, very problematic because society has changed. And growing up in the 70s, because I was born in 1966, but I, I consider myself growing up, you know, in 1976, I was 10 years old, Michael Jackson, The Silvers, Sister Sledge. There was, I used to love myself. I, was, I had the biggest crush on Sister Sledge. I used to love all of those girls. I remember um, getting their album cover and just looking at it and just like, oh man, because they were so beautiful to me. They were just so beautiful. And I really feel for the men of the day who do not know what it's like to ask a girl out on Monday, she says, sure, and then you pick her up Friday, you don't have to send a confirmation text, you don't have to be all weird, you would like arrive at her place and she would be ready or she would be getting ready, you go on your date. It was effortless, it was so easy, it was just, and then I learned as I got older, because I got married and then I got divorced, and then when I got divorced, it was still way easier to get a girlfriend after I got divorced than it is today. But it started to, the difficulty started to increase. It really started to increase. And you know, I was still working out, so I still had the body, so I, that helped out a lot. But one of the things that I noticed was society was starting to deteriorate because I remember, you know, and a shout out to the dude who commented from Inslee and went to Holy Family Entry Month. He actually knows of the Birmingham that used to be. Because Birmingham, remember I knew, one day I was watching the first 48, Birmingham, Alabama was on that show. I remember when I was a kid, five o'clock, Birmingham was shut down. The sidewalks would roll up. Uh, it, it went from that to the first 48. And I look back growing up, having BB guns, shooting birds, and I just look at all that stuff. And I feel so blessed to have had that type of childhood and that young matriculation versus what you guys are going through today. Because uh, frankly, you're going through some bullshit. You're literally going through some bullshit. Because one of the things is, people used to be extremely stable. I never got flaked on until I was 40 something. I never knew what it was to ask a girl up and she wouldn't show up or not call. Didn't know what that was, didn't know what that felt like. That's like common today. And one of the things is society is deteriorating um, even quicker because I was having this conversation the other day with someone about Bumble, and I remember when I got on Bumble, I was crushing Bumble. And in like three years, Bumble just became trash. It just became trash. And um, I remember getting on Bumble, and literally the first day matching up, and literally the first day getting dates. It don't work like that anymore. So society is steadily deteriorating from what it used to be because uh, once again, people were stable. You never had someone flaking you and giving you fake numbers or this, that, that, that stuff just didn't happen. Now it's commonplace, it's the norm. And for those people who, uh, who are in the battle, you once again, you gotta have game today. You, you gotta have game. You, you gotta have game or you just ain't gonna make it.